When last we left Trinity, South Carolina, Dr. Matt Crower, who had been one of the few consistent thorns in the side of Lucas Buck, was carted off to a mental institution after being conned into thinking he was some kind of antebellum Hitler demon. Although, was he really conned if the thing he believed is accurate? Also, during a plague of biblical proportions in Trinity a few weeks ago, Gail Emery finally relented to her lust and had sex with Lucas amongst his, frankly, non-erotic statuary. Yes, there will be fallout from that. Things have returned to somewhat normal for Trinity. Caleb has a part-time job cleaning the sheriff's office, which is where we catch up with him and Deputy Ben. Ben clumsily traipses around the office like a bull in a china shop and kicks a bucket of water on the floor. In a freak accident, Caleb knocks a lamp over and electrocutes himself. Okay, who had Caleb dies in the cold open in the American Gothic bingo pool? Buck takes him to Dr. Billy Peel, Super Doctor Agogo, and they do the paddle thing. You know, you you've seen it. Caleb has an out-of-body experience, watching them trying to revive him and then running into Merle in something akin to heaven. She seems really happy that he's dead. Lucas Buck appears in the afterlife and tells Caleb that Merle is hiding something from him. Caleb can choose to live if he wants. But Merle didn't want him to know that because she's afraid of what Caleb will become under Lucas's tutelage. This is some wickedly perverse fallout from Inhumanitis, where Merlin learned that Caleb's fate is to inherit Lucas Buck's mantle. And I don't just mean the nice gothic mansion in the middle of town. So Merlin would actually have preferred Caleb to stay dead rather than let him go down the wrong path. And that's the moral gray area I wish the show would have survived to explore. It's really interesting that the protagonists of this show, Merlin and Dr. Matt, came to the conclusion that you just need to kill the head fascist and deny people the ability to make informed choices, and fascism will be solved. I'm going to let that sink in for a moment. Caleb gives Merle a big hug and returns to the corporeal world with Lucas. Billy gets the credit for Caleb living, but it was clearly Lucas's magic. Elsewhere, we get our doomed antagonist of the episode. And these are such EC Comics stock characters that you just know things aren't going to go well for them. In this case, they're bumbling kidnappers who plan on extorting some of that sweet, sweet corporate tobacco money out of a CEO named Ralston. They're keeping him in an isolated shack in the woods, as you do. We can already tell how they're going to go out, too, as all three kidnappers treat each other like garbage. In particular, Jerry, the female member of the group, constantly seems to be angry at something. Who hurt you, Jerry? Jerry is married to Cody, but she seems to get along better with his brother Ted. Ted, by the way, is played by Ted Raimi, brother of series co-creator Sam Raimi, and a guy you've probably seen most recently in the excellent cinematic horror game The Quarry as Sheriff Hackett. Does this look like the goddamn Harbinger Motel to you? Cody also seems to be pretty condescending to his brother. Lucas and Caleb are on their way to an out-of-the-way fishing hole to celebrate Caleb's recovery. And that's when Lucas tells Caleb of an urban legend about a monstrous cat-like creature who haunts the woods of Simpsonville. And that's why Simpsonville is so isolated. Everyone was killed off. Lucas also takes the opportunity to ruffle the feathers of Selena Coombs by tricking her into thinking Billy is breaking their date for a fishing weekend with the boys. Well, I got uh, Caleb here. He was just wanting to make sure you weren't kidding about fishing. Uh, of course not. I just got me a bait casting rig. What was that all about? Uh, I don't know. I promised Caleb I'd take him fishing next week when he's feeling better. At least Selena gets in a good dig about Caleb bringing his own worm on the fishing trip. We're going fishing. Hmm. Huh. And I see you brought along your own worm. Hmm. That's good shade. Ralston tries to make a break for it, so Ted shoots him in the back. This portrayal of Ralston as a guy who thinks of himself as invincible is perfectly situated in 1995, one year after the infamous tobacco hearings in which every major big tobacco CEO claimed under oath that nicotine was not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. The industry later settled for $206 billion in an agreement that expires next year, coincidentally and the CEOs were investigated for lying to Congress. But it was that same sort of Teflon attitude that Ralston displays here. He doesn't cooperate with the kidnappers the entire time, somehow thinking he's in control. We're gonna send that ransom. No, not the entire no, amount! You Anywho, Ralston is half dead, and Ted is freaking out. Things get worse for Ted when Caleb and Lucas show up at their cabin, which just happens to be where the kidnappers were keeping Ralston. Ted pulls a gun on them, but it's Lucas Buck, so Lucas just plays mind games with him until he can wrest the gun away with ease. I'm not telling you my name. I call you Ted. 
Caleb discovers Ralston's body on its last legs, which enables Gary Cole to go on an absolute tear of funny lines about Nietzsche, the conscience, and how Ted is really just half Ted. It, that man is half dead. And you halfway took us hostage. I'm going to call you half Ted. The lesson for Caleb is that if you're going to do something like kidnap someone or kill them, you actually have to follow through and never let your conscience be your guide. The moral component to the act is less important than the strength of your will. Jerry and Cody return, assuming that Ted has double-crossed them, and after a brief shootout, they decide to wait until sundown before storming the cabin. Jerry, who just openly started firing into the cabin with abandon, accuses Cody of flying off the handle and not thinking things through. A monkey gets thrown in the wrench, though, when Selena shows up looking for Billy. Selena and Buck immediately start in on each other, and Buck uses it as a teaching opportunity on love for Caleb. In love, you gotta go straight to the heart. That's why they invented the dagger. He corners Cody and offers to let him go with most of the money, and all Cody has to do is leave Ted and Jerry behind. Cody agrees to go dig up the money. Ralston dies, forcing Ted to confront the fact that he's a murderer. Ted Raimi is a highly underrated actor, by the way. Maybe not in the way of range, but he's very good at this kind of thing. Back in Trinity, Dr. Peel and Gail Emery are worried about Selena and Caleb, so they agree to go searching for them, despite Deputy Ben's assurances that Selena and Lucas will never leave each other. Deputy Ben's recognition that Gail was just as interested in finding Lucas as she was Caleb is a rare bit of good insight on his part. Caleb goes full creepy kid, approaching Jerry and telling her that Lucas told Cody about her and Ted. He and Lucas celebrate with a soda and some sandwiches, while Lucas tells him that he was never in any real danger once Jerry found out about Ted because she was too preoccupied with love. <sighs> Caleb could have been killed. You know that never would happen. Lucas goes on a long rant against romantic love, in a speech that predates the same rhetoric in the manosphere by about 20 years. Caleb, this uh, romantic love thing. What do you know about it? From observation, quite a bit. Of course, a lot of the speech is for Selena's benefit, and Caleb is oblivious to all the metaphors. Sidebar, God damn, Gary Cole is good. Miss Coombs loved her tuna sandwiches. It was a pleasure to watch her eat one. This whole scene is just a masterclass in being smarmy, manipulative, conniving and charming all at once. Selena finally relents and eats a tuna fish sandwich in a way that would make any straight man and any gay woman envious of that sandwich. Sidebar, Brenda Bucky is also really good and it's a shame that Hollywood never really figured out a way to use her talents the way that this show did. Jerry finds Cody digging for the money where Lucas told him it would be and Lucas's plan starts to mousetrap its way to fruition. Where'd you think we were all those nights, darling? Jerry accuses Cody of killing Ted out of jealousy but Really, she just reveals their affair to Cody. Cody charges her, forcing her to shoot him in self-defense. And of course, there's no money. In the car, Billy and Gail go from casting aspersions at their significant others to commiserating about being outsiders. Well, the guy's got the morals of a sewer rat, and I don't know, you seem to me to be a pretty nice girl. Who are you to talk? You're the one who's doing it with the town tramp. At the cabin, Lucas teaches Caleb how to manifest what he wants to have happen, and Caleb manipulates Jerry into kissing Cody's corpse, thinking it's Ted. <laughs> you. Selena tries a last-ditch effort to pull Caleb back from the dark side, noting that his soul is at stake. Lucas's retort, which is basically, I guess I just think more highly of the boy's ability to make his own choices, would seem too cartoonishly obvious to be manipulative if it didn't work in real life every four years. At any rate, Selena doesn't have a chance to get through to him because Jerry fires a shot through the window. Caleb manifests the Simpsonville version of the Jersey Devil and claws Jerry in the face. Clever callback. The next morning, as they're loading half Ted into the car, Jerry pops up and takes Selena hostage, demanding the money. And now Selena forgets her morals and asks for Lucas to kill this bitch. Caleb simply walks up to Jerry and asks for the gun, wordlessly letting her know that there is no winning situation here. It's a nice parallel to Lucas and Caleb's father, Gage, in the pilot episode. Too late for salvation, my friend. Gail and Billy arrive just in time to get in on the tail end of everything. Caleb jovially tells Gail she wasn't actually worried about him. She just wishes that she was at the cabin with them. And we're out. The title Learning to Crawl has a pair of meanings given the events of this episode. And those double meanings make for the best titles. Caleb is learning to crawl as an edgelord extraordinaire under Lucas. And that's an obvious interpretation. This episode is one of the series best in that regard. Lucas's explanations for women's behaviors are rooted in a grain of truth, but the conclusions are absurd. That's what makes it so sad that a veritable cottage industry sprouted up in the age of the internet. These kinds of things were sold to young men who were, frankly, 
frightened of women. Of course, in the narrative, it works because Selena gets manipulated and Jerry gets manipulated and Gail comes running after Caleb. That's what happens when you have two dudes writing the episode. Men's manipulation tactics tend to work much better when men also write women to get manipulated. Funny that. It's also the other interpretation of the title, which is Selena in particular is learning to crawl right back to Lucas. Caleb, can I have a drink your soda? Call them love languages or romantic styles or whatever you want. But we've talked about how Selena tries desperately to engage in deeper emotional relationships with people, but she can only see the world through a sexual lens. So Lucas becomes her on-again, off-again sex partner, Gail becomes her rival, Ben becomes her submissive, Dr. Billy becomes the object of her desire, Dr. Matt is the asexual man she can't manipulate, so he doesn't matter, and Caleb becomes the innocence she doesn't have the tools to protect because she's so sexualized. I get the sense that if this series were made in 2015 instead of 1995, Selena's outcome would have been vastly different. Even though this feels like a criminal of the week story like Strong Arm of the Law, it actually sets up some explanations for Selena's behavior late in the season by revealing the push-pull relationship she has with Lucas and how she's ultimately incapable of adhering to any kind of moral structure because she's all about drive. Now what the sheriff is trying to tell you is that it's alright to hurt people. But everything on God's earth doesn't take place here and now. This is gonna have to play out the way it's gonna play out. Well then play nice and kill this bitch. Huh? Sex drive, hunger drive, survival drive, it's all on display here. Besides that though, the episode varies widely in writing and performance. The rule is, everything with the main cast and Ted Raimi is great. Everything with Jerry and Cody is just awful B-level stuff. I don't know if it's the acting or the paper-thin writing, but Everything was over the top with these two. And this could have been a banger episode with better motivations, better performances, something. But I'm not one to dwell on the negative. Caleb is firmly in Lucas Buck's clutches now, things are starting to roll to the conclusion, and Merlin just shot her credibility with Caleb. But maybe she has other avenues. 